Hey everybody, this is Jason with Curious About Cannabis. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. So today I'm joined once again with my friend and pest management specialist, Matthew Gates. Matthew, thanks so much for being willing to come on the podcast again. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited. Oh yeah, and it's always funny. We always tend to do an episode like towards the beginning of the year. Um, so it's kind of becoming a, um, like a regular thing. But I know you've been working on, and if anyone wants any background information, go back and see. Um, this episode is Matthew's third episode, so um, go back a few and you can find the first episode and get some background information. But um, I wanted to just jump in. I know you've been working on a ton of stuff, um, like guest presentations for several events. You've been working on a lot of content creation that I've seen coming out of your um, Zenthanol um, account. So the first thing I just wanted to ask you is what's been going on and um, um, where has all of this work kind of set your mind in the world of integrated pest management and sort of thinking about the new year? So I appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of those things because to be honest, um, I don't always get the opportunity to do it at home or in other aspects <laughs> of my life. And it's something I'm very passionate about talking about. So some of those things are, like you said, I've been in a whirlwind of different presentations. Um, a lot of them have been for like uh, YouTube, like with uh, the Future Canvas project. Mm -hmm. um, I, just went, I just went over some of my analytics from various other people, various other podcasts that I've been talking to about IPM, Integrated Pest Management, Ecology, the world of cultivation and innovations, and also things from traditional um, uh, cultivation strategies and things like that, and how those can be sort of expertly fused together in sort of an adroit and optimized way. And I'm very excited to see some of that. I'm always using these presentations as an opportunity to also refresh my own knowledge because yeah. new stuff comes out. And so like, for example, I'm, I'm pretty proud about my presentation for the Future Cannabis Project's Zero Two channel for budworm moths, for botrytis, and also powdery mildew recently, because um, for one thing, they're something that they're very interesting. They've got a lot of interesting capabilities that make them, well, very difficult to deal with as pests, but also... Yeah. You know, they, they didn't come out of nowhere, and so they have a lot of interesting adaptations, some of which I know that we've talked about here and I think in other capacities. Yeah, that evolutionary history is always um, really interesting. I know we, we talked about in a prior episode a, maybe a little bit about, um, I know we've talked about powdery mildew um, some, but I don't know how much we've talked about botrytis. I hope we don't overlap too much. But um, what were some of the kind of takeaways there? I mean, particularly I'm thinking about, because uh, we always end up talking about like evolutionary history and, and how these things have adapted over time um, to kind of become as we think of them today. But what are some, I guess, uh, misconceptions that people maybe have about botrytis since that's a, such a common um, pest that cannabis cultivators have to deal with. And um, what were some things that you found really interesting as you were preparing for that talk, um, looking into that? Absolutely. And the big thing that we that I'm referring to here is exactly that uh, occupational hazard in mind to look at the yep. 10,000 foot space of the evolution of various things and so I'm very interested in that. So that's the thing that I often am pulling at people's ears about. But with botrytis, there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, and the reason why I did botrytis and powdery mildew right next to each other is because a lot of their um, capabilities are misunderstood or they are conflated with each other. So like, for example, powdery mildew is infamously called a systemic pathogen that can like mm -hmm. live inside the tissues. And that's not true. Whereas botrytis is that pathogen that does have that ability and also various other interesting things like some species are uh, not even, some botrytis species are not even uh, very parasitic or pathogenic. They don't cause problems yeah. for their hosts sometimes or only certain times. Um, some strains of botrytis scenario are even known to develop a symbiotic 
interaction or rather a mutualistic interaction specifically with some algae and knapweed um, in marine environments. So they're, they're obviously very capable of this sort of interaction. So they take, and a lot of times this is because they take a bunch of skills that they got powdery mildew and botrytis from their ancestors that were uh, detrivores or in other ways sort of innocuous or even beneficial microbes uh, that would break down plant matter, animal matter, other sorts of things, mostly plant matter, and then use, and then yeah. those th- that would become the nutrients for the next season, right? But it turns out that um, if you know how to unlock the door to get into the plant and to get all those nutrients, <laughs> with a few adaptations, you can do it while it's living too. And that's kind of where, where we are now. Yeah, that's that's really cool to to think about. And I remember I had a, a farmer one time talk to me about his perspective on botrytis. He was a you know an older grower. I don't remember how old he was, but he had been growing for a really long time, decades and decades. And um, he told me that he viewed botrytis as um, you know a, a very simple kind of ecological way that the plant kind of uses to um reduce its uh seeds and everything back to the ground he was like you know the the plant flowers it makes these seeds at the same time you have you know these uh what would normally be considered pests that are coming in to kind of eat all of this stuff break down all of the stuff this plant that's at the end of its life cycle and he's like and then conveniently it's like you know that helps these big fat domesticated seeds then get dropped to the ground and um, you know, their life cycle continued. And I was like, that's a nice, uh, perspective to have, you know, like most people, um, you know, are really, uh, fearful of these kind of the end of life pathogens that, you know, um, you know, that we're really talking about with, with bud rot, botrytis, um, and things like that. Um, but it's always kind of interesting to think about those adaptations and ways that if you're not actually just worried about the resin of the cannabis plant, you know, um, some of these microorganisms play interesting roles in that plant's final bits of its life cycle that help it continue. So it's just intriguing. Yeah, I have to agree with that. It's sort of like, um, if you understand what it's like in nature, then you can kind of understand its role potentially even in, agriculture although in a lot of cases even things like botrytis will have damaging effects on on other other aspects of the physiology but Mm -hmm. if we understand where it's coming from we might even be able to mitigate it in a way that is uh sort of ecologically conscientious so that is the goal i think and what um what would be responsible ecologically responsible controls um to things like that i think you know because back in the day before there was really a lot of talk about ecologically conscious cannabis cultivation you know you would just kind of start running to to various fungicides and trying to you know stop things as quickly as possible or running to sulfur but um what would be the recommendation assuming that a cultivator has discovered that botrytis is setting in at relatively early stages. You know, they're not discovering something that's fully, you know, kind of gone at that point, but maybe they're just starting to notice signs. Um, and obviously they're in flower. So what do they do? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, for a long time, I don't think people had a really good um, availability Maybe the technology was there or the knowledge was there in aggregate in general, but yeah. not for cannabis growers or at least not easily accessible uh, as a product or something like that. But as we've become a lot more um, aware and as people have made more sort of bounds in research, some of the microbial biopesticides have become a lot more favorable. Of course, they're better when used in a preventative fashion, but right. you can also mm-hmm. use them as a reactive treatment as well. And uh, specifically when you're in a situation where things aren't like overtaken already and you really do feel like it's a very small colony that's developing, then you can use some of these parasitic or otherwise antagonistic microbes that develop compounds and proteins that are bad for the fungus, Mm -hmm. but not bad for us. And I think that's a critical point to, to make there because 
after all, you know, people get a little bit uncomfortable when you start talking about adding more fungi or bacteria potentially. So, and that's very understandable. I think it's important to understand what's going on and why it works and why it isn't, for example, harmful to you. Some legislation uh, seems to be kind of lagging behind on this appreciation themselves. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, an example I like to think of uh, for this kind of thing is the lobster mushroom. You know, the lobster mushroom is a yes. mushroom that's actually, you know, another fungus has attacked a fungus and <laughs> kind of turned that fungus into this edible, delicious treat. Um, and it's, it's interesting how microorganisms can do that, that they can, um, you know, take over, uh, another fungus and render it not only completely safe, but even tasty sometimes. Um, not that I'm encouraging anyone to go out there and start eating molds, but, um, <laughs> this is, you know, this is a very tangible, um, process that I think, um, can help people understand um, kind of what you're talking about and, and how, you know, we do have examples of where this does happen in very safe ways when you understand, um, the biology and what's going on. Um, and then on the, you know, it's interesting on the testing side, when you're playing around with a lot of biological controls, there are, the regulations are definitely behind in terms of trying to understand what methods are adequate to test for, potentially harmful microorganisms in cannabis. There's still a lot of places that use fairly generalized testing. And, um, you know, for instance, if you're doing just a broad yeast and mold test, you'll see tons of colonies on a plate that you've inoculated uh, from a cannabis sample. But until you run DNA tests, you don't actually know what organisms those colonies represent and whether they're bad or good or, you know, indifferent. Um, so unfortunately that can then lead to a, um, you know, a sort of mechanism that pushes people away from biological controls because they're scared to fail a mold test, for instance, or, you know, something like that, um, which is an issue that I think is starting to get talked about a little more. I see people on LinkedIn kind of, uh, really talking about it. There was a, a couple of years ago, some things that went on in Michigan that led to some, reviews of methods of plating versus DNA testing um, that kind of promoted more of these discussions. But I feel like it's still not appreciated very much. And a lot of states haven't done much to try to um, rectify that issue. Like if we want more ecologically, you know, sustainable cultivation practices put in place, then people shouldn't be worried that they might fail a, um, you know, a yeast or mold test if they're if it's a microorganism that's not dangerous. Absolutely. And on top of that, there are, um, there are various techniques that people want to use sometimes to maybe even uh, collate and aggregate some microbes from mm -hmm. the greater environment and, and whether or not, you know, how do you know what you're getting, even in products that you might be applying where there's like, you know, you know, to use a very scientific term, a bazillion different ones, and yeah. you don't necessarily know which ones are doing the thing that you want. Um, a lot of observational bias comes into play. I'm not saying that products that do that are bad necessarily even, because um, yeah. there, there are several that are quite nice, and, and it's, it can be to a benefit. But when you, when you dig into a lot of the, especially recent research that does a lot of uh, OTU barcoding and... Mm -hmm. You know, the omics, the multi omics world is now expanding at a rapid pace, has been for a long time. Yeah. You know, you dig into it and you learn things like, well, geez, it's really a lot of these interactions are very consortium oriented and it's very mm -hmm. hard to replicate. You got all these variables. Um, you try to pick out different populations and whether they do things kind of well, whatever that effect is. You know, is it replicable? Yes. Okay. Is it mo is it just this population? And and importantly, can it do it independent of others, or does it really require yeah. one, two, four, twelve different uh, populations? And you know, I'm not, it's like uh, I don't want to sound unsupportive because I'm very supportive of using some of these techniques, and I think that there's a 
a, there are several, I think, use cases where it's very appropriate. Mm-hmm. But on the same on the same token, uh, I think an an ideal regulatory body would at least at the very least be interested in the safety and well being of other people, and at least verifying and making sure that these things are the are not that way. But even if you do a test, like there's still a snapshot in time. Yeah, you don't yeah. know what happened before or mm-hmm. after. Yep. And um, you can't necessarily tell visually. And a lot of people, I think, have a um, difficulty with that fact, that mm-hmm. reality of how it is, no matter where you are on the spectrum. Well, and the uh, <laughs> the visual detection of um, molds and stuff has been really controversial for a long time. And I, I saw the controversy come up again recently with, um, I'm sure you saw it because it got so much... Um, so many rounds on social media and everything, but there was the, um, was it the cowboy cup in Oklahoma? Um, but there was an issue there where uh, a bunch of samples got dismissed for, um, visible molds and things on the, the canvas flower. And I don't know the details, you know, I didn't see the, I don't know if they ever released the images or whatever. And I, I didn't see much follow up. Um, but it, it raised this question of like, how do you get trained to visually recognize, um, microorganisms on plants and what sort of role does that have to play in quality control versus um, molecular testing and all sorts of other things. Um, so this issue does, it, it it comes up again and again in different contexts um, in the industry. How do we measure these things? What are we measuring? What do we need to be measuring? Um, what do we actually know about the products that we have? And um, still a lot of low hanging fruit of research, I think, to be done there. Um, just in, in trying to establish better methods, I've wondered, you know, what sort of, um, sort of simple, even, um, like different types of fluorescence methods and stuff could be applied to identify some microorganisms in a more, uh, qualitative fashion rather than quantitative, just trying to get a sense of, you know, what, things might be there just by um, shining certain lights and things, taking certain types of photography. I remember um, in some of the medicinal plant labs at Ole Miss back in the day, there was, you know, there's various fluorescence and staining techniques and things they would do to monitor microorganism populations and roots and other things that they're looking at. And I haven't seen much research like that with cannabis yet of people just growing cannabis under different, um, microbiological treatments and things and then staining the roots and just looking to see um you know how that all gets translated and um there's a little bit i know there are people i see people posting you know sort of their private experiments and stuff but i haven't seen much um you know of of like peer-reviewed published research that's really um done some of that work and it seems like it'd be so simple and easy to do like just some student out there at a university that's listening to this right now, like just go knock it out. It shouldn't be that hard. Um, there's tons of methods on how to stain um, roots and things with plants to look at different types of microorganisms. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. I think that um, in some ways, very surprisingly, in other ways, perhaps not so much given the prohibitionary history and all of that, but, but still, you know, it's, it's a, uh, there's a lot of things that we already know from other agricultural sectors that can mm-hmm. definitely be implemented here in a responsible way and in a very, um, you know, admittedly probably succinct way um, mm-hmm. to kind of test out some of these ideas and some of these uh, um, understandings, <laughs> not to be too vague. Yeah, but it is, it is, you know, something we talk about a lot and we kind of often bond over is like how how to help people make sense of, of information they see, um, especially with cannabis, because it can be so marketing driven and emotionally charged and all sorts of other things. Um, but there are all of these, these claims. And, um, one thing I was, um, asking you about recently was whether you had a chance to play around with chat GPT or any of the AI, because, Um, I have a a suspicion there's going to be a flood of really, really bad, similarly worded blog posts um, (laughs) that I'm I'm sure are being published right now 
to tell people how to grow cannabis, how to recognize pests, how to do all of these different things. Um, and it's going to make this job of trying to help people decipher information um, possibly even more challenging than it already was. Um, cause it's like the floodgate of, um, shallow information is, is hitting the internet right now with AI. I just want to say that as a child of the nineties, um, I'm ready. Um, I've been, I've yeah. been pretty much yeah. preparing my entire life for like a dystopian cyberpunk, biopunk esque <laughs> yeah, yeah. future since about 1997, 1998. Yep. Um, so, <laughs> so in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm already, I'm already ready for it. Um, uh, mentally, emotionally, you know, I've watched Ghost in the Shell. I already know what's coming, yep. but, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, but, uh, no, I, th I think that, I think that's a really good point. And it's, it's one of the first things that was suggested to me about chat GPT was like, Oh, you could make a bunch of articles and just be done. And like, First of all, people are paying for my actual thoughts and my actual words, right. and I just feel like that's that's just gross to me on one level. I I do think that it has use though as a tool, absolutely, yeah. and particularly mm -hmm. for perhaps even search engine optimization. Or I've heard from some people that SEO is now perhaps going to be maybe not outmoded, but at the very least, how we track that, and how we mm -hmm. uh, appreciate the value of that whole system that we use to like find information and see and then like how Google like structures like, okay, this is the most relevant thing to what you're saying. This thing's relevant, but we're not going to tell you about it because the government told, told us not to and all that right, kind of right. stuff. So I do think there's a lot of good use for it. Uh, so I don't want to come across as a Luddite, but I, I do feel like it's, um, it does have an exploit, an exploitative nature that, people might make use of it that will maybe create a lot more junk rather than actual valuable information. Potential. Well, I, I've already seen if you go on YouTube and you start watching any videos about chat GPT, you'll start getting flooded with all of these videos that are like make $5,000 a day by, you know, oh my gosh. creating yeah. all of these blog sites <laughs> and get AI to, you know, write all these things and sell them. And, um, you know, so those money machines are already churning, um, and it's really funny because it reminds me of the same hype right after NFTs really got popular, um, you know, a year or so ago. Um, and there were all it does these have a similar flavor. All of a sudden, yeah, and it's like here's how to make a bunch of NFTs and sell them and make all this money. And um, funny enough, I actually, you know, I've been playing with with some of these AI systems for a while, and and just like you, it's like I've been waiting for Skynet and all of this <laughs> stuff to happen forever. So. Um, you know, I've been juggling these philosophical questions for a long time. So it's it's fun to finally start to see some of it um, exercised a little bit, I guess. But I, at one point, I asked ChatGPT um, how these language processing systems, because that's, you know, basically all these, the only reason these AI systems are, sort of quote unquote special is because of the um, these language processing systems that they use in combination with machine learning to, so that they can digest information and sort out uh, the quality of that information and find ways to communicate it in different styles and ways that, um, you know, is more nuanced than previous text-based um, sort of AI systems. And it's it's incredibly impressive, but I asked it how it would influence search engine optimization because that's the first thing i thought of as a small business and like someone who's trying to raise awareness of my brand and content all the time um and one thing that was kind of encouraging is it said that um you know there'll be a couple consequences of the widespread adoption of of using these chat-based ai systems um and that one is that it's it's likely that humans will use them as an alternative to traditional search engines, which I could already see that very easily. It's because um, it's already taking all of this information and distilling it and, you know, theoretically taking the best information from a lot of sources, distilling it and, you know, communicating that at you know, whatever level it needs to. Um, so in a lot of ways, it does kind of transcend the traditional search engine, which then 
makes the way you think about search engine optimization totally different. And right now, there are a lot of, for people that don't know, there are a lot of websites on the internet that their sole function is to crank out keyword laden blog posts, you know, just on repeat as quickly as possible to try to get to the first page of Google when you search some of the most commonly searched phrases on the internet. And it yeah. contaminates the pool of information because it means that what you see is not necessarily what's the best information. You just see what's laden with the most keywords that Google's bots thinks are relevant to the question you're asking. And so ChatGPT said that um, by getting away from traditional search engines, the likely outcome would be that humans would be forced to produce higher quality content because that would be the only thing that would actually stand out um, in a future where search engine optimization is relatively obsolete. And it's really just a competition of who has the best information because these AI systems will be able to identify the quality of that information and translate that back down to users. And, um, and so they're, you know, they're kind of, incentives potentially as you know once we get through the the muck of the beginning of all this stuff playing out that there could be a potential future where we see a lot less of that uh shallow content and that it's ignored by these ai systems and the only thing that really is seen is high quality content and that's that's an interesting future i like that um interpretation does seem to come from a biased source, though. So absolutely, but, uh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely comes comes from Skynet uh, itself. But uh... Uh, but you know that does that does seem to flush really well with what I was reading about um, earlier, and I also kind of had a similar intuitive feeling that that could be the case. Like, yeah, at the beginning, it's probably going to be very messy as people like cling to old techniques, and mm -hmm. you know standards update and that kind of a thing but i i could totally see how a system like this could have major benefits in that way you know and for people who are listening you know i uh you know not to make another gits reference but like what did the puppet master say for those who know the reference you know humans have <laughs> underestimated computerization or something like that and you know this is a fictional depiction but it's certainly the case yeah. i would also say that i'm very interested in um and I've been very excited about like how, because yeah, you're talking a lot about the human facing interface of the, mm -hmm. like with chat GPT and these sorts of things. But like, it's very exciting to see other aspects where it's just the use, the, um, I should say the analysis and then subsequent synthesis of data, large amounts of data that a human would be very beleaguered to go through or would be impossible to really consider in a timely manner and with great accuracy. And so I'm excited to see that with regards to looking at things like from everything from, if we go back to IPM a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, micro aerial vehicles or drones that are using data from light that reflects off of the leaves of yeah. their plants to tell, Hey, there's a pest here or Hey, there's damage here or, or Hey, yeah. in some cases, this is a specific pest we think based on, in some cases, uh, I've even seen examples where there were no visual signs of this pathogen uh, visually to our unaided eye, but there were signs that were invisible to us that do exist because they changed the like reflection or the refraction of light mm -hmm. in like the yeah. in yeah. like the water and the leaves, and so they were able to tell a pathogen was there before it started causing damage, physiological stress, and that's very exciting to me as well. Being able to count a bunch of bugs on a yellow sticky card is yeah. maybe a more mundane example of that. But I'm certainly an acolyte of um, cybernetics. And for those who are very interested in this, you should definitely look up what are called second order cybernetics, mm -hmm. uh, cybernetics of cybernetics. Yep. Yep. Uh, we get, you get into really interesting ways that uh, the human mind and body interfaces with technology and information in general. And um I don't know if we'll reach a point where we're just uh, cruising you know, through the digital landscape, like, uh, Tron again, style. like, yeah, Tron style, <laughs> <laughs> just in the cyberspace itself. Um, but I do find that very interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, um, it's going to be fascinating to see how all of this affects, um, 
the way, yeah, of course, like my educator brain, you know, I'm thinking about how people just interact with information and seek out information um, and what it could mean for education in general, like the education systems at large, you know, something that I've been thinking about. And of course, I have a lot of old professors and then I come from a family of teachers. So there's a lot of teachers in my personal social networks and everything. And um, when ChatGPT first came out, of course, they were all freaking out about um, how easy it is for kids to cheat, how much easier, because it's already pretty easy. Um, and mm. now it's even easier. And um, the discussions that kind of spun out from that is like, well, doesn't this highlight the <clears throat> just how inadequate our education system actually is if we're so threatened by the idea that a student can use a tool to crank out essays you know, it's like, well, is that essay, like, what are you actually trying to measure from that essay? Do you actually want to know what they know? Because if so, then we probably need to start really focusing more on experiential learning, demonstrative assessments, and um, oral assessments. Like, actually have people, you know, that are capable actually tell you or show you what they know rather than just writing, you know, a standard essay, taking standardized tests you know, et cetera. Um, and of course that requires, um, more human work. Um, you know, it's kind of nice that tests can be standardized and everyone fills out the same scorecard and it goes through a machine and you test them all really, really quickly. And you've got numbers associated with everyone really fast and you can crank all that data. Whereas, you know, when you're doing, um, different types of assessments where you students are demonstrating their mastery it requires you to pay attention and to watch and to be involved and um think critically about what that student is presenting and so it kind of um i don't know i think if any teachers are threatened by some of this stuff it's almost like a call of um <sighs> like an existential crisis sort of like well why are you teaching and what is education because ultimately you know, yeah, this is a tool that's not going away. Um, just like we were saying before we started the, uh, started recording, it's like when calculators came out, it's another tool that it's like, okay, there's a lot of stuff in education you don't need to memorize anymore, <clears throat> you know? And now it's like, let's teach kids how to become better at asking questions because that's what's going to determine how well they can yield, uh, that they can wield a tool like this is if it, the better questions they can ask, which gets into philosophy, logic, and a lot of things like that, um, then the stronger they become because they have this awesome tool that allows them to find what they need to build what they're trying to build or do what they're trying to do. Um, so there, you know, there's that side too, of like really questioning just how we approach education and, and that kind of stuff. I really love it. I'm like, these systems have been, bad and terrible for a really long time so yeah let's let's do better and if this tool is gonna force that to happen then great <clears throat> yeah um and you can tell me if i'm right or wrong about this but i'm very glad that you brought up philosophy and and logic and that kind of thing another thing that i'm very interested in isn't that particularly aristotelian of you <laughs> aristotelian yeah of uh because was well, it aristotle or yeah, there we go. Was it not? Uh, I'm usually so good with words, but uh, was it not Aristotle who bemoaned the uh, the written word for remembering things, or am I thinking of a different ancient Greek philosopher? Well, I I'm always terrible at remembering um, stuff like that. Um, there was a philosopher that um, oh gosh, it's going to come into my brain. Um, is it Wittgenstein or... Wittgenstein, my favorite Wittgenstein. I like Wittgenstein. I'm trying to remember if it was him that... Um, regard That would talk Sartre. about how uh, he had an example with the rock of like when you try to use words to describe the rock, you're not really communicating what the rock is. And the only way to communicate what the rock is is for someone else to experience the same thing that you experience that you call rock. And... Um, you I know, feel like so that is Wittgenstein. I think it is, yeah. And so it, it it very much kind of gets into that 
aspect of like, okay, what are you actually teaching if you're not getting the students to actually experience and get into the subject in, you know, a direct way? Um, and yeah, I think there's, there's a lot to be learning and gained from that. And philosophy and logic education has been very undervalued and pretty much absent from most major public curricula in the United States, at least, um, for pretty much ever. I mean, there's been like debate classes in some schools and stuff like that, but um, not really, you know, true philosophy and logic that I, I would think of it. And look how it's and look how it's depicted in media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I don't think I don't think I think anyone who's listening here knows or probably had an emotional response when you said debate club. Who were who goes to the debate club? You know, right, it's like right. not not the cool kids. Certainly not. <laughs> uh, maybe the people who employ them though later on. Who knows? But um, you know, it's. <laughs> I agree. It's it's sort of it's sort of a thing that could could bear a little bit of. Um, of a resurgent, a renaissance, perhaps. And, and that would be really cool, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And, and yeah, I, I do think... We were talking earlier, yes, before we were recording about, like, the unteaching movement mm-hmm. and that yeah, sort of a yeah. thing. I'm, I'm curious, because of your um, family history and your own um, uh, professional accolades, what are your opinions about that with unteaching and the unteaching movement and how this could play a role in that well you know it kind of depends on on how you define what the unteaching movement is because some people have slightly that's true different flavors of it um what's your flavor but um (laughs) i guess the flavor that i like the most is the idea of um you know deconstructing education as we think of it getting away from trivia um regurgitation of of facts in that which is really what our public school systems have been based around for a long time um you know you just regurgitate facts and that's how they check things off in the grade book and and you move along and even if you don't move along you still move along because they can't just yeah. not move you along <laughs> so it's no <laughs> it's just a totally you know screwed up thing so i've been You know, when I was in grad school, that's where I really studied education besides my exposure from my family. You know, um, we went through my graduate program was like half uh, graduate biology and, and, you know, doing all the science and research stuff. But then also half of it was, um, you know, like three quarters of a master's of teaching program and, and sort of combine all of that together. And so I was able to see a lot of alternatives to traditional public school and um, common core curriculum and all of that sort of thing. And I've seen some examples of really interesting um, programs and some of those have been considered like unlearning programs and some of them are, you know, like kind of what people would consider as homeschooling, but it's not Mm. called homeschooling. Uh, This is where it's like confusing, like all the words that these groups use for some of these things. Um, but out even of, unlearning sounds ominous. It does, yeah. It's like, well, if you're unlearning, <laughs> then what's left? Hmm. Um, Do I really want that? <laughs> right. And you know, the best example that I've seen of kind of a a good alternative, and I can't remember the name of the school, um, and I can't remember if it was technically a, like a Waldorf school or something like that. Um, but it had a very unique curriculum structure that was very nonlinear and based around projects and skills that were indexed off of a child's um, passions. So like whatever they mm. demonstrated interest in each year, there was sort of a a path to follow that would end up kind of weaving itself through what we would consider classical um subjects like history and math and all that sort of thing but it wasn't presented that way you know there was no structured presentation of what we consider education reading writing arithmetic stuff it was just you're just doing things and there are different sort of um levels of mastery as you're sort of spinning through the spiral of of kind of project and experiential learning and 
and trying all these things. And a lot of times it involves like at some point when the kids are older, trying to build their own business and trying to learn how that works and tying that into the, all the things they've done in the previous years. Um, and so it becomes much more of a just expression of your life more so than like this thing that you went to, like I went to school and then I, you know, did these tests and got through and graduated. It's really more of like, this is my life and everything that has come about that's been graded and counted as, you know, uh, something as part of a curriculum is really just sort of after the fact. Um, and I'm very drawn to that, that approach in general, because I think that people are capable of learning almost anything if they're passionate enough to apply discipline to their curiosity. Um, and, and I've seen that, um, with a lot of students that I teach that claim that they're not good science students or, you know, the, I have people that take my workshops and get really nervous about the chemistry. And they're like, I never went to college. I dropped out of high school, whatever. And I'm like, don't worry about it. Like, just be prepared to ask questions and take good notes. And, you know, really the biggest thing is like, just don't stop asking questions. Let me know when you don't understand and just keep asking and things will click eventually. Cause everyone that you view as like higher than you as knowing more than you at some point they were at your level and something clicked and then they, learn more. And I think that the way the education system is set up now, it really kind of ruins that process um, because we don't have enough room for an individual's passion to take them anywhere. It's like the passion gets in the way of the curriculum rather than the curriculum sort of fostering the passion. Um, and so in the best flavors of the unlearning movement, I think it, it presents itself as something kind of like that. Um, in the less favorable flavors of the unlearning movement, it's kind of just like education anarchy. Um, yeah, yeah. I've seen this as well. I have to agree with you. I think that I know what you're going to say at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it, it gets really uh, disorganized, dysfunctional, and I think can actually be damaging. Um, so that's why I'm like, yeah, it depends on what you mean by unlearning. But I want to give it the, the most positive... Um, uh, conception primarily, but then, yeah, there are a lot of people that take it to this nth degree as with everything. Um, sure. and I, and I've seen these kids, I've seen kids that have gone through, um, this sort of like school of unlearning and they have, they have a lot of passion and things, but there's no, um, they're just sort of like all over the place and there's no real direction. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, I've definitely seen some negative outcomes with kids, both behaviorally and just like there are things you do need to know at some point. Um, you know, like there are certain <laughs> uh, principles of mathematics and other things that like you really should know by a certain age. Um, so, you know, it's a balance. Yeah, like in, even if we look at the traditional sort of didactic approach, that I went through, you went through, Yeah, you know, the assembly, the assembly line, the Prussian assembly line method, as I've heard it talked yeah. about sometimes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like there, I mean, of course, you know, and I think that's where a lot of the criticisms of the current approach of teaching in a lot of, like, you know, in the United States, for example, where like there's a recognition that you can't teach a kid everything, perhaps, yeah. especially in the structure that it is currently. And, you know, you are kind of asking a lot of perhaps teachers and other people like what, like now we're going to be like, you know, gods of teaching that we can like know all the subjects right, possible. Right. And we have to, you know, account and accommodate all these different, very uh, vibrantly different people and, and capabilities and all that stuff. But, you know, like, for example, I remember uh, a big debate when I went to high school was whether or not they would reopen the auto shop. Now, mm -hmm. at the time... I was not very uh, automotively inclined. I did like engineering, and we had a really swank uh, robotics team. And apparently, we or we I was never part of it, but apparently, the Devil Duckies did really good. Nice, um, particularly good. So good for them. But uh, I also remember I had to I had an advanced placement. 
I had several AP classes growing up. No, uh, that's not meant to be like a, you know, anything. <laughs> but nerd. Uh, I had nerd. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. I had to choose between like AP psych and like AP environmental science. Or yeah, yeah. one of them was uh, we had a college student and uh, who came, or not college student, sorry. Uh, Dr. Smith, John Smith. What a great name. I You're tried right, to look him up. Yeah. <laughs> later on it was very difficult um the doctor part is very was, important <laughs> yeah from 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 uh from scsu uh taught political science and uh if dr smith is listening right now then i'm very i would be i would tell him that i really probably one of my favorite teachers ever he came over to teach us uh and we got college credit we actually got college mm-hmm. credit in high school for it which is really a cool um uh, system but um he learned from the from the staff that he couldn't, he wanted, he was going to teach political science, political science 101, 102. And then um, he was like, but you guys aren't going to learn any, any economics. And I just learned that one of my colleagues, you know, you had to choose between me or them. Uh, you know, you guys need to learn both. So how about yeah, this? Yeah. How about I teach you for the first half of class, we, te- we learn political science. And then we do uh, home economics or like regular economics, like 101, 102. And it'll be a good fusion. And we all said, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, we even got we even got uh, involved in the political process a little bit, which was a really fascinating. We got the opportunity to work with a um, this might sound a little bit weird to people. We'll work with the political can- local political candidate and like do some because we had to do uh, um, some public service or something for graduation, right, a little right, bit of volunteer yeah. work or mm-hmm. something. So so and I think that was a splendid way to like kind of get introduced to that sort of a thing and I, and I kept going after after that fact I actually ended up um, helping the candidate pass that uh, they didn't win unfortunately they were independent um, but uh, you know that, that I thought that was a really cool thing and um, I guess my point is that you can't fit everything into your schedule but mm-hmm. um, I do see where it could be improved certainly and I definitely know that in, uh, and, and also I had a really great English teacher, uh, Mr. Staninger. I will definitely name drop that person because they just stopped teaching for like 32 years of their life. And um, I remember he got up on the whiteboard and he would, he would do this with all the students. Apparently all the students would always say like, Oh, we don't have enough time to do all the work. It's like, Oh, you think so? Well, let's, why don't we itemize your day and see if that's really (laughs) true. And you know where this is going, you know, it's like, well, what did we need eight hours of sleep? Okay, eight hours of sleep, cool. Okay, well, we're in school six hours a day, okay, six hours a day. But there was still quite a bit of time for us afterwards. And um, anyone who's familiar with uh, uh, <laughs> Chinese or Japanese schooling, yeah. like myself, I'm very familiar with how strenuous and difficult and how, you know, it's really like the, very much like the work in China right now, the, what is it called, the nine. 996 movement, uh, which is 9 a.m., 9 p.m., six days a week. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's wow. for work. Wow. wow. That's, but yeah. <laughs> so, you're always doing work. You're always doing after school. Like, it's not over here. It's like, oh, after school work. Or, I'm sorry, after school learning. Like, that's for, like, remedial. Like, if you screwed up or you don't know. Or right, you need to, right. like, learn more for, the, for, for college or whatever. But over there, it's practically mandatory. It's Anyone expected. who's not doing that is not... They're not serious. And um, over there, they even hire people in groups, like a batch. Like, companies will come in and over there. I mean, Japan in particular. I don't know how common this is in China. But, like, uh, you know, at, I think it's at college, you know, like, there'll be, like, hiring batches at, like, the beginning of the year wow. or whatever the, wow. you know. <laughs> I don't think they do that as much now, especially in the last few years. But it's a different system and everyone's system is different. So you have to account for that too, I guess you have to like regenerative agriculture and and agriculture in general. Like there's a scientific aspect Mm -hmm. of it. There's a empirical aspect to it. Like, does this work? Does this, is this feasible? How does this work? How do we make it work? But then there's like a sociological aspect. You can't just be like, yeah, well you you can, but uh, historically speaking, it doesn't work really well when you just tell everyone to get off of their land and then we're going to turn this into (laughs) a, farmland and you got to go move and yeah yeah um, so <laughs> yeah well and, and make steel in your backyard well and some of what you said it ties in nicely to thinking about how these ai systems can be useful tools because um it will become and it has with just wikipedia and things like that but it will become increasingly yeah. easier 
for teachers to be able to bridge their own knowledge gaps um, and to be able to say, okay, you're interested in this and you have this passion and we need to make sure you're hitting whatever benchmarks. So let's find a way to work with this and let's, you know, let me figure out what I need to know and let's figure out what you need to know. And we can use this AI system to help us quickly identify those knowledge gaps and quickly identify, um, you know, ways to, you know, even just different activities and things to be able to dive into without having to spend hours Googling and trying to look at stuff. You can just say, my student has an interest in this. What are 10, you know, hands-on experiential learning activities that they could do, you know, around this topic? And just within 30 seconds, you know, they've got things to think about. And even if they don't use those, like, well, that gives me ideas for X, Y, Z. And so just the way that it could help facilitate some of those processes to open up more possibilities to people, I think is, is very exciting. And then, you know, on the other side too, what, what made me bring this up originally was the idea of this sort of interim time period that we're stuck with right now, that we're going to see just tons of uh, terrible uses of, of these tools. Um, I think it's going to be really, really, really important for people to, um, more so than ever, to get really good at tracing information back to primary sources, because mm -hmm. um, I think one thing that's going to be a red flag for a lot of these new blogs or blogs that start using AI to write their content is it's going to be harder for them to, <clears throat> Not, I guess it depends, but unless they're using things very cleverly, um, it'll be likely that they don't cite their content as well as they would have otherwise. It'll probably be harder to identify where content's coming from, and that can be a red flag. And I've noticed if you talk to these AI systems enough, you kind of learn they have certain ways of presenting language and ways of talking, ways of... Um, they have certain phrases and things that kind of come up repeatedly. Yes. And you start to notice those. And so I hope people will kind of quickly start to get tuned in on how to how to recognize um, these systems. And there's already systems being built to detect AI, AI text as well. So um, maybe we have that to look forward to. But um, I, I, you know, something I'm wondering, do you have any... Um, anything you imagine that people might um, try to ask... AI in terms of like cannabis IPM and things that could uh, really send them in the wrong direction? Yeah, I have actually asked a few questions to test. When I tested out chat GPT myself, the very first thing, one of the very first things I did was just ask for some general information about certain tests. Um, and, you know, to its credit, a lot of basic information, what's basic to me at least, um, was... Like 90%, I want to say, uh, correct. And, and like you say, uh, there seemed to be a bit of like a, you know, a Turing test-like evaluation of like its verbiage and how it presents mm -hmm. that information, the text and the phraseology and that kind of thing. You know, definitely I could kind of pick up, I was talking about uh, nematodes. Uh, I was asking about two different nematodes recently and um, it kept giving, it kept giving this line of text, which was like, pink and orangish colored or something like that and i was like this doesn't sound correct um you know so then of course i asked like well how do you know this and then it's like <laughs> giving, and then it actually did like here to its credit i got the research the people who wrote the research excerpts from each research report that uh it it gave me gave me a bunch of information at once sort of that's really um, cool that was really cool and so that that did assuage some of my concern. And I think that, you know, if we could go further into that, that, uh, uh, that direction, I think that there's excellent value with regards to other IPM things, you know, it's like, it's kind of like what you were saying with the lobster mushroom, you know, it's like, you better be careful with like, can you eat this? Can you not eat this? You know, like, like health and safety, mm -hmm. I guess it's sort of an effect. You also touched on something that's not IPM related, but you know, with, with regards to like this, uh, auto-generated or computerized blogging. I think that uh, 
I've already seen like videos on YouTube and elsewhere where like it's like a it's very obviously like a Microsoft Sam or something mm-hmm. voice and yeah. it's all like let me tell you about this topic that you have Google searched. And, <laughs> yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, and so 10, people. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, like, oh, I want to, I need to buy like a new mouse or something, mm-hmm. you know? And it's all, it's like, you know, we've already thought about this. And here's all the Amazon links. And, <laughs> you know, like, and that was, that was, go- I mean, obviously, like, people were working on this AI stuff for a while. Um, but uh, even before this recent frenzy, mm-hmm very recent frenzy that we're kind of at the precipice of you know i definitely saw the harbingers already and i think that we could move away from that and more towards um a more intelligent use of the 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 technology but certainly you know uh already now people sometimes have trouble if not citing the sources at all even just like going back to the source and being like like being able to make sure like oh is this from a predatory journal does this make sense Right. You know, did I actually read the the source itself, you know, or did I just read that little line with no context? And that can that can get you into trouble already. And I'm sure yeah, that that will yeah. continue to be a problem, you know. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's really cool um, that you can get chat GPT to tell you the sources. And I think that's um, something that anyone listening to this that wants to play around with chat GPT, which I'll say, if you go on the curious about cannabis website, um, cacpodcast.com, I have a virtual assistant um, demo on there that is, it's um, connected to the same GPT three technology that chat GPT is connected to. Um, and you can play around with it, ask it questions and things, talk to it and see what kind of information you get. I want to eventually train it on cannabis science specific um, information, um, which is a task that is bigger than you might think it is. I think a lot of people think you can just like send a bunch of text into these AI systems and they just like read it all and learn it. But you actually have to really build fairly complex data sets of like potential questions and responses in all sorts of variations. Um, so it takes, a, it's quite, it takes quite a while to train the systems, but um, I do want to try to do that, but it's, it's helpful, I think, to let people know some tips on using these systems to try to make sure that the information they're getting is good. Because I have found, um, you know, of course, I sat down and asked a ton of cannabis science related stuff to, try to see how accurate it would be. I even um, pressed it to like write poems and songs and stuff about cannabis science to see how it would do with that. And that was funny. There was one where uh, I can't remember (laughs) all of the lines of the song that I had it write, but I had it write a song about cannabinoids. And there was one line, um, um, one line that was talking about like the, medical promise of thc and then it said something like and all of the lies about cbd and i was like that's the interesting uh, like uh, bias that it that it put in there um yeah so there's just interesting things like that but knowing how to press these systems and not just take them at their word um when i notice errors like just factual errors and content that it presents sometimes i'll just say are you sure and then just in asking it are you sure it'll find its own errors and then correct them and say what I should have said was this. Um, and so I think it's good that's for cool. anyone listening that's playing around with these things to know that you can ask these questions, ask the system to check itself, and um, ask it what its sources were. Um, but I will tell you, I've gotten down the rabbit hole of trying to ask it um, about the, the whole data set it was trained on, which is a, a you know obviously a massive data set going up to 2021. And um, the system gets really weird when you start asking it um, questions about, like, uh, (laughs) I was asking it, what would be the consequences to the human race if you were allowed to connect to the Internet and uh, scrape, you know, data um, in real time? And it it has all of these programmed stock responses. It does not want to answer that question, but if you get creative... (laughs) you can um yeah. get it to to give you a more real answer and it's uh it's a little daunting because it's like humans would probably um rely on ai to make most decisions and it would become extremely difficult for humans to 
make decisions on their own and um we already have that problem so yeah exactly it's like get <laughs> worse. it's like our brains just start yeah. <laughs> like disappearing from the inside out um but yeah no it's it's fascinating and i'm interested to see just from a education side how we can leverage these things to connect people with reliable information quicker and i think a big part of that is teaching them how to critically evaluate systems like chat gpt um and so uh, i didn't even plan on really talking about this so this is i'm like now doing an inventory here i'm like there's we've actually talked about uh -huh. some good tips ask the system what its sources are um ask it if it's sure that it's <laughs> correct or not um uh, try to make sure that the content it's giving you <clears throat> actually has primary sources that it can trace things back to. Um, and it's all... Read iRobot. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, read uh, iRobot. Yeah. We haven't learned know, anything from Will three... Smith. <laughs> yeah. The three what directives the three or whatever. directives, right? And uh, I was going to ask, you know, like, uh, like I was introduced to the concept of uh, dumb AI and smart AI from, like, uh, the like the Halo series, but certainly mm -hmm. it does not, so did not start there. It started, you know, decades before, but like, you know, the concept of like having like a dumb AI that can like do quite a bit. And, mm -hmm. but like, it's very much restrained. That's kind of the idea versus like a truly kind of like emergent intelligence, mm -hmm. um, a la the puppet master from ghost of the shell, a la like right, Cortana right. or things like that from, I hope we didn't turn on everybody's Microsoft machines there, but uh, you know, like <laughs> Alexa, and, and yeah, <laughs> and like the fact, but but that brings up a great hey, point. The 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 very um, the very fact, the very fact that Microsoft um, decided that it would name its yeah. personal assistant software Cortana. Knowing that so many people my age and younger than me and even older than me, like there's like an emotional response to that from like a video game series that's very popular. And okay. also the fact that it is dealing with the same things, it's kind of creating this um maybe in a Baudrillardian sense of the word, this sort of like hyper reality um mm -hmm. kind of thing going on. And uh I think that's interesting. I also own, you know, speaking of this isn't quite the same thing, but uh I own a VR device and uh, I haven't really played it a mm -hmm. lot because Meta has <clears throat> made it clear that they're going to be scummy. <laughs> so I'm just not going to yeah. have my eye movement tracked if, if that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But I, I find that stuff interesting as well. And augmented reality being able to like put on like a set of like, I thought Google glasses were very interesting as a concept where like, you know, if I could use that to like, because my brain kind of works that way already. I feel. I, I guess that's yeah, kind of the point. Yeah, I know what right? you mean. But like, but having like a a HUD essentially, uh, you know, that could be really cool. Yeah, I don't know. Well, and I, um, I augmented reality. I'm very excited to see continue to develop. Because even if it's not, um a screen that we put directly on our eyeballs, you know, like there's been experimental contact lenses and things that have been developed and, you know, all sorts of stuff. But, um, and Google glass, it, you know, it was kind of interesting how big of a flop that ended up being. And I don't know if it was just cause it yeah. was like too soon or what, but too expensive I, maybe. Yeah. There's just a lot of barriers and just a lot of practical issues. But I think about, um, for instance, every time I'm driving, I think about augmented reality because I'm like, you know, at what point yeah. we already have projected displays in cars now that some of them look really good, really interesting. Um, but at what point do we really get to utilize all of this real estate on the glass and using that, use that for more interesting display purposes, being able to overlay real time information with the world that you see around you. Um, being able to identify like what's that city in the distance oh it's got a little name above it you know like little things that yes. just make interacting with your world easier um, and more sort of like a video game um, in terms of being able to access 
you know, like stats and information and stuff about the things that you're looking at, being able to work in a, a sort of like workspace and all this. That's all so possible in a car. And I think it's just interesting. Yes. That's an interesting um, application where it could really see some interesting things done with augmented reality. Of course, with our phones, there's already tons of interesting apps and things. Um, and, you know, something I've thought about is I'd love to see a sort of Pokemon Go style video game developed, but with actual nature that encourages people to identify oh, yeah. plants and animals and things. And there's already the iNaturalist program, you know, which is an open oh, yes. source program for collecting observations. And it's like, let's find a way to, with augmented reality, which iNaturalist always already has an app called Seek that identifies with pretty good accuracy a lot of plants and other organisms um, just by looking at your phone. So just imagine taking that like a step further where you're on a hike and interacting with things and you're not only able to identify organisms but identify interesting facts about these organisms and their chemistry and the ways they can be you know, used in wild crafting or, you know, all sorts of different sort of opportunities to teach people about nature and um, how they relate to it. Also, like environmental impacts, hiking into a place and being able to see um, sort of like pre-erosion soil levels and different things like that. Mm. Uh, being able to mm -hmm. actually really see how things have changed and been impacted. Um, those kinds of things go a lot further i think towards driving changes in behavior um than anything else like just that sort of immersion um and direct confrontation um with the facts so um yeah i get really excited about augmented reality more so than i do virtual reality at this point i think virtual reality just still has a lot of technical hurdles to overcome it's going to just be a while before it feels comfortable for people to spend a lot of time in VR. And I've, I've played around with it tons and love it. And of course you've seen like some of the metaverse stuff I've played with and, um, yes, but it is, um, I think augmented reality will become more relevant to people sooner. Um, yeah, it's going to be neat. I, I geek out about technology stuff hard. It's all, I've always been a techno geek always will be. Um, so any of these kind of technological changes, even, you know, when blockchain was, has been rolling out over the past 10, 15 years, um, I'm obsessed with that too. All of this stuff I could talk about forever. The original reason why I even got a, a VR device was not so they could play Half-Life Alex. It was because <laughs> I wanted to play, I wanted to, uh, there was a really cool, um, I got it right before the pandemic too. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought I'd be traveling a lot more in the near future. <laughs> and uh, I thought that I would be like in a hotel room and sure, you know, I could play video games or do whatever, you know, and to pass the time I'm in a hotel. I mean, sure. I could go out and do stuff, but like a lot of times I was going to places it might be snowing out or blizzard who right, knows? Right. or just, or whatever. I don't want to go out for whatever reason or I already did. And I can strap on the Oculus and um, I, I liked the personal assistant. I could also have it be connected to my home desktop virtually. Mm -hmm. And so I could do things on my yeah, desktop yeah. while I was in my hotel. That's a really cool concept. Um, you know, I didn't get to play around with a whole lot of it. You get to, to play test it that much. And by the time I did actually have the opportunity, I was kind of like already kind of disgusted and, just over it. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah, kind of. But I and and I guess you know not to elongate this podcast too long, but no, I fine. also play around with with AI uh, art a little bit. In fact, mm -hmm. one of my short videos I posted, I'm sure that people eagle-eyed people, a lot of people mentioned it. I don't think anyone really commented this, but uh, indeed, it was AI art that I was using with a voiceover. You nice. know, because I. I couldn't, uh, I didn't have all of the pictures I wanted to. And I was like, why don't I just try it out? Why don't, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen so much cool stuff. Oh, of course, though, because I'm the technical person. I've got a lot. I probably have to learn how to use the right keywords. But also, um, 
you know, it's kind of hard. And here's here's one thing I got back from, and it was the one that everyone's using on the Discord channel. What's it called? Mid Journey. Um, Journey, yes. And, yep. you know, uh, because I was asking questions about parasitation and <laughs> oh, infection no. and... <laughs> the the I got a I got a pushback. It was like, hey, you know, we're not trying to. I don't want you to be doing stuff that's gross or you know things. That I, yeah, I got considered. one of those one time too for yeah. <laughs> things I was searching. Is like we're not sure that we want to generate something based Talk on these it. inputs. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, <laughs> okay, okay, I appreciate it, no problem. But once I learned the right thing to say, and you know, I got some really good pictures. You can check out that video and. um it wasn't i mean it wouldn't be perfection necessarily mm-hmm. uh but it definitely i think got like the visual feeling the sentiment yeah. that i was trying to get across and i think that was good enough that was good enough i think mm-hmm. so um i find that to be kind of endearing although i definitely appreciate i don't first of all i don't think that's going to replace art no, or anything like that yeah. um you know as much as like being able to cook food at home doesn't replace restaurants or growing at home doesn't replace dispensaries for that. Well, and you think about like how much crappy filler art there is in the world that Yeah. Um, I feel like that's that kind anymore. of where it where it fits in. I mean, obviously AI art can make some really stunning images, but again, like ChatGPT and the responses, there's a certain repetitiveness. Uh there's a certain style attributed to some of these AI works, even though they, they produce things in different styles, they're still like, I, I can look at something and if I know that it's AI art, which a lot of times I can tell, I can tell if it was stable diffusion versus mid journey versus, mm, um, mm-hmm. what is one of the other ones? Um, well, those are the main two that I play with these days. Um, or runway is another one. There's several, um, but you kind of get accustomed to how, the systems output art and it doesn't take very long when you've been playing with it or seeing it to get kind of dialed into that. And so I feel like a lot of this AI art, um, for the most part, there'll always be exceptions, but for the most part it's sort of going to fill this niche of when you need, just like you said, something quick and easy, that's good enough, you know, like yeah. Yeah. it's just something It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't need, it just needs to, fill this spot and convey a certain feeling and then move on. Um, And so I agree. I think there's always going to be room for human art, at least for now. Um, (laughs) Going back to the, the the sort of dumb AI to smart AI, you know, like um, I was watching an interview with that guy from Google that made all the headlines because he said that the AI was sentient. Um, Oh and yes, that, that yeah. caused a big buzz, <laughs> and you know a lot of people pushed back on that, and like, of course, it's not sentient. And actually, just, I don't remember what program it was on, but it was a fairly long, like eight minute interview with the guy, where they just let him talk without like really trying to shut him down or anything. And he actually admitted that he did not, uh, he was not really s- totally serious when he s- made the claim that it was sentient. But he's like, but it got mm. me on the news. It got this conversation going. <laughs> And he said, I felt like it's very important that right now the public is thinking about the ethical considerations of the development of these systems. And one thing he pointed out, and and to your point about dumb versus smart AIs, he was like, the way we're developing AI right now is it's sort of inherently dumb. Like we hard code it to be that way. We give it certain Mm -hmm. responses to questions so that we don't let it go. We don't let it crawl the internet. We don't let it do a lot of these things and one thing that he mentioned that was a little um it's a little disturbing if you haven't really thought about it before is he was like how do we know if we've created smart ai if we've never if we never take the you know the sort of protective layers away and he's like what if we get to the point where we have created a smart ai but it's basically a slave to all of these limitations we've put on it and we've never asked its permission to do anything with it you know but it along the process has emerged you know because of the complexity of the systems involved of information processing it has this emergent consciousness and we've never you know had the ethical consideration 
to ask or you know try to engage the system at its full capacity to understand what we're working with and it was a it was a thought provoking interview um that you know it does make you think about like what sort of ethical considerations should be built into the development of ai systems how do you you know i asked chat gpt as like you know uh would you be able to pass a Turing test. And it was like, no, I wouldn't uh -huh. for these reasons, you know? Um, <clears throat> yeah. But I have a hard time believing it's going to take very long before um, these language processing systems are at a point where the language is not so repetitive and it's not so easy to detect um, what's AI generated and what's not. And at that point, it, it kind of, you get into these weird philosophical situations of like, okay, if these systems ever did have any sort of emergent consciousness, and by default, we hard code them to, you know, not do a lot of things or not speak their truth. So, to, you know, um, um, yeah, at what point have we crossed that line? And we may cross it before we realize we've crossed it. Um, and I don't know, that kind of stuff, I really... I really like thinking about the whole idea of emergent consciousness, I think is something people don't, uh, I think they underappreciate a lot. I think we often think about humans as being these special things that have consciousness, but from the best we can tell, it only takes a complex series of information sharing to produce what we call consciousness. And I don't think there's any reason to think that that's limited to people. And to shut it down for that matter, um, you know, very interesting research in the medical field and others about like anesthesia and, mm. you know, how consciousness is affected by certain, certain facets. I'm, I meant, you know, uh, philosophy of mind is very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big Massimo Pigluici fan, yeah, a big yeah. Daniel Dennett fan, Daniel Dennett. Uh, as far as I understand, is part particularly it takes umbrage with the um, the very common like the mind is like a software program right, metaphor, right, yeah. even though it helps with a lot of understanding on a surface level. Like you know, one of the, apparently one of the things he does in his philosophy t classes that he teaches still, um, I think, or at least he did in the presentation I was listening to. Uh, uh, I guess he has them do like basic computing. So that mm -hmm. he knows, yeah. so that they know how how poor of a metaphor it really yeah. is. And I think yeah. it's very relevant to this here, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think I think you literally did just outline the the Ghost in the Shell movies uh, literal yeah. premise. Yeah. So if people are interested in this, please you know uh, go find it on the internet. Uh, watch watch Ghost in the Shell and, and, and Matrix and all those movies, and you'll you'll be an expert in no time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I took a really good um, <clears throat> philosophy of film class back in the day because um, that was my first degree was philosophy. Um, and uh, we watched. Um, that must be why we're such good friends. Yes. I, I see now. Yes. Yeah. The connections, <clears throat> which I always um, I forget to mention a lot of times because I'm always talking about science stuff. But, you know, like philosophy is um just incredibly important to me and as, as like I, i'm serious when i say i've thought about all these things most of my life um ever since i watched i <laughs> this may be bad to admit but i watched terminator 2 when i was like four years old and oh, sure. I, um i that movie made such an impression on me in so many ways where i was you know just thinking about like what if computers like all of a sudden you know had a moment where they were self-aware um <laughs> yes <laughs> but, you know it's it's um it's fascinating stuff and we're getting to the point where um the ability for humans to interact with machines in a much more direct way obviously Neuralink is being you know worked on and there's oh, sure. similar adjacent technologies being worked on like how do you make this link between the machine and the mind and start getting that communication going um, you know, it's like where we are tiptoeing into a lot of these realms where <clears throat> I don't think as a society we pay enough attention to the ethics involved and and those sort of considerations. Um, and we tend to just sort of say like, oh, well, those were movies and, you know, 
that's not really yeah. what's happening. So we can just ignore it until something does happen. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's all just happening all the time. And uh, it's something I've worried about just with AI and the systems that exist already is the ability to do nefarious things um, because sure. there aren't ethical considerations in how these systems are built. It creates incredibly powerful tools for good, but also incredibly powerful tools for really terrible things to take place. Um, and uh, there's already been some examples of that um, just in using AI to parse like chemical libraries and things to find oh, yeah. um, target um, um, you, you know, toxins and things to develop for um, you know, bioterrorism and that sort of thing. So um, there's always that side to consider as well. And I know that for those listening, we have veered completely off topic from <laughs> cannabis or integrated yeah. pest management for the most part. But um, it's, it's just super fascinating, relevant stuff for the, the time we're in. And I guess to, to try to bring things back around, we've been going for almost an hour and a half, I just realized. Um to try to close things out, I guess we can do a little bit of cannabis science here, um, right at the, <laughs> right at the end. Sure. Um, yeah. so sort of the classic question, I even think I asked it to you, um, last year, uh, cause we did a, we did an episode around the same time in January, but as people are thinking about planting and thinking about the coming year and their grows. Um, what's some advice that you would offer to folks out there and feel free to integrate AI into your response, however you like. Um, but, um, especially based on the presentations you've been giving and, and thinking about, um, not just insects, but also, um, you know, last time we talked, we talked a good bit about viruses, um, and then this time, you know, we've been talking a little bit more about like bacteria and fungi, but, um, what do you think, uh, what's your best advice for folks in terms of kind of checking on their IPM plans or if they don't have one, um, developing one, how can they use chat GPT to build their IPMs? We can throw those keywords in there. I'm sure YouTube will love that. Um, yeah. but yeah, what are your thoughts as people are preparing for the new year, um, as spring is, you know, kind of a couple months away? Well, you know, since we made this episode, some of the theme of like technology and, 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 and in this case, AI, I'll say this, that, uh, I was not getting when I said in my presentations, I take it upon myself to kind of refresh my own knowledge, my own domain mm -hmm. knowledge with new research. I'm always constantly doing that, but a presentation gives me a better reason to sort of like be directed in that way and maybe focus on a few different examples and like with my budworm video you know i i mentioned this uh drone this sort of yeah, micro aerial yeah. vehicle the pats x and the pats c system from um the from pats i get i guess the company um they're in the netherlands and uh uh it's a technology where there's an I ir scanner and it mm -hmm. scans for moths and it discriminates different species, which is amazing. And that then is, yeah. it, right. And so like, you could, don't have to, you, you will target only the pest ones, which is fast, which is like talking about ecological conscientiousness. That's great. That's an excellent use of technology, you know, um, assuming it works really well and, and all of that. Uh, and so where I'm getting with that is, and then it uses a drone that comes in and kinetically destroys the moth with his propeller blades. So <laughs> that's so, nice. So it just hones in and runs into the them. ear. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. That's really incredible though. That's, that's wow. And it's a, it's unique to me because although, uh, you know, probably has a very violent visual in your head and, and indeed it is as, as uh, sure. grotesque as you might think it is, you know, but like, I feel like that's a very clever use of like an aspect of IPM, like um, phys what we might call physical controls. Exactly. Physical treatments exactly. That don't rely. No chemistry is used. You don't even use any, you don't introduce any biologicals, which yeah. might even get into the general environment, you know. Um, there's a feel like soulless. There's a feel like it's, you know, it's not your own. You're not, you're not doing it yourself or some like, um, I don't even know what the correct terminologies 
are with that sentiment but like you know there is this sort of primitivism i think that is very popular sure, and yeah maybe looks at that as like you know incorrect in the way that like the jazz singers maybe like the new jazz has no soul if you don't use an acoustic <laughs> instrument <laughs> right right um you know so like, yeah, in like that, you didn't in make that your drone study. from sticks and rubber bands so uh <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> um that wasn't uh you didn't that wasn't your own ir scanner or whatever. <laughs> yeah, i don't know but yeah. you didn't put your eyeball like that, in there yeah i just feel like um you know new technologies are on the rise and that yeah one of the best one of the best things about them or at least for the best uses of these technologies i think is using them in a way that does allow us to be more ecologically friendly, not less so, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think that moving into the future, I feel like we're just going to see a lot more of that. We already are seeing a lot of that in so many other technologies and fields. Um, I'm excited to see that become democratized and become more available to people. Another thing that's becoming more available to people is like, uh, like a, and it's not perfect, but like genomic, not genomic, but like genetic sequencing, uh, like the nanopore systems that I see sometimes people mm-hmm. are using. Some people are getting quite popular and famous for using it, even though anyone who does know about them knows that they're actually quite limited and uh, you should maybe re- rely on them for like a um, totally thorough evaluation right. of genetic material. You know, so like, you know, look into it. Don't let somebody who is like very interesting or very charismatic, you know, maybe goad you into thinking that they are some sort of like, you know, super special soil biologist because they bought, you know, a, you know, baby's first genetic sequencer. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. 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 Um, Yeah. You know, uh, let's see what else I feel like. Well, I feel like other things that are very important is that, uh, Things are changing in the environment, Mm -hmm. the climate, for example. And um, that's probably going to continue to some degree. And that's already having massive, I live in Southern California, that's already having massive effects on in other places. We we are continuing to have this atmospheric river, which is deluging us with with water. I'm I'm happy Uh, as a a desert person. Rain is still a novelty for me, to be honest, even though I've traveled to many places, uh, snow and rain. You know, it's very nice, very interesting, very fun. <laughs> and it's not salty. You know, when it's not, when it's, yeah. Well, it's not like smashing your um, houses with like tree branches and things, I guess. Yeah. But uh, what I'm trying to say, though, is that basically there are also going to be technologies and also implementations that are going to change with, with that with that change. Mm-hmm. For one thing, the, you know, the sort of the farmer's almanac or like the traditional yeah. sort of appreciations for your area might change it might change significantly um it kills me to know that many places in the world where we rely on certain kinds of um agricultural produce are are very much changing i did a video a couple of years ago about hazelnut powdery mildew Mm -hmm. for example they had one on their leaves and then a new one came about that was not new, new, just new to their area. Yeah. And now it attacks their nut clusters and, and like Turkey, for example, like they rely on like 70% of their national income is on like, is like a hazelnut manufacturing and, and production and that kind of thing growing. Yeah. So things like that, places are going to be, you know, you've probably heard of like the vanilla bean dying out or like places where we grow coffee and chocolate, you know, that's going to be, or the, the, the materials in order to make them are uh, becoming more difficult to do that. So I just feel like going forward, we're going to have to use some of these technologies, like it or not, um, to, to make things easier and, and more beneficial even, and perhaps even remediate some of the problems. Um, I know there are people, talented people, looking at carbon sequestration and using a biological approach, mm-hmm. um, you know, very Star Wars, <laughs> Yuzan Vong sort of way of like, <laughs> Maybe we're not there yet, but um, uh, you know, I'm here all I'm here all night. You know, <laughs> maybe I should make more <laughs> pop culture references. Uh, but like, yeah, like we're, you know, I think we're people. I think that ultimately, a lot of people are very interested in doing things ethically above 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 all things. And at least the people who are probably watching this, yeah. Um, and a lot of the people like I grow with in contact, you know, they 
they're they're interested in just being uh they're interested in being ethical they're interested in growing in the in what they would call an appropriate way that doesn't harm the environment and that's something in our generation that I'm not saying that people of previous generations didn't care about they didn't necessarily know all the details right. and and or couldn't do anything about it anyways so i'm very excited to see that uh sort of crest mm-hmm. and sort of continue to become a lot more um well, just a lot more important, I guess. I know that's a little bit anticlimactic as a statement because I think a lot of people <laughs> already see that, but I am excited about that. Moving yeah. Forward. And all and the technologies we're using to evaluate our surroundings, I think, could do that, like many of the things we talked about on the podcast. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I'm very interested to see how these um, interesting situations with weather and climate um play out you know now that i'm in the southeast um you know we had an interesting cold spell that came through here not too long ago normally Mm -hmm. it's it's fairly warm where i am and um i was talking to a friend of mine that um has several different farms nurseries and things in florida and they mentioned um you know, that it was sort of like a once in a lifetime thing that the temperatures got so cold um, during this winter in Florida that it's really affected a lot of crops that normally overwinter. And yes, um, we had a cold snap, I think. I remember reading about that. Yeah. And <clears throat> we were talking about it. And one thing I asked is, like, what do you think this will mean for pest pressures um, in the coming year? Since normally you don't actually get the sort of cold that you've got you've got to imagine that impacts um communities and populations of of insects and things in all sorts of ways you're gonna have some dying offs that normally don't happen um as well as other you know just different conditions that you know might send some eggs and back into you know rather than than sort of like developing and and growing as they would um you know they could sort of get in back into a stasis and then maybe die you know there's like all these little things that happen mm-hmm. when you introduce sudden cold you know into into a system and then just broadly from outside of the southeast these kinds of things are happening everywhere um and so i'm i'm interested from a pest perspective i'm interested to see um how that all plays out over the next year um with all of the water that um, different parts of California and Oregon have been getting um, thinking about issues around humidity and stuff that normally would never be thought of. Um, Something I'm fascinated now that I'm living back in the South is just how cannabis, you know, what people are doing to grow cannabis differently in humid areas versus the arid West. And, you know, it's it's interesting to see a lot of consultants that come from the West that come back to the Southeast to try to grow, and they often fail because they don't realize just how different it is when you have so much water around and the unique pests that then come about from that, all the other dynamics that come in. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm very interested to see how people continue to learn and adapt to the changing environment as well. I think that um, more and more that ability to learn and adapt is going to be um, ever more important to keep farms in business. I have to agree. And also, like you say, like a lot of things are dying that wouldn't normally, and things are living when they normally wouldn't be. For example, a lot of places rely on the fact that they'll get like a, a cold weather pattern like a winter Mm -hmm. and that will kill many things. And, you know, maybe you still get the bugs as they uh, sort of travel out of the other places, you know, but, you know, ultimately you would expect you would have this sort of grace period. And if you don't get that grace period, then that's going to be a huge change. Right. Yeah. And that kind of a thing. And I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about our abilities to sort of, um, to, to adapt to that, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I think that yeah. we're pretty capable. And and I think that there's some really interesting ways that we could go about that. But 
yeah, I guess that sounds a little too auspicious, maybe. But uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I sort <laughs> well, of petered out. I I'm trying to be a little bit more. Um, I'm trying to be a little bit more precise in my wording. But uh, you said you seem to have an idea. You want to say something? Well, no, I was just going to say that, like you said before that all of these technologies and tools that we've talked about over the past hour and a half all play into into this of maintaining that adaptability it's it's going to be more and more important to be able to get that data and for that data to be reliable whether it's environmental data or data on exactly what creatures are crawling through your field and on your plants and being able to respond um quickly and being prepared for risks and pest pressures that you might normally not prepare for it seems like that um more and more is is really becoming important um you know i again just thinking about these atmospheric rivers that you're talking about the movement of water i just keep thinking about water um, and where water goes, life thrives. <laughs> and so um, when you have water being spread out over all these different areas, again, I'm just very, very interested to see, particularly in California and Oregon, um, I'm really interested to see what some of the um, pest pressures are like, both insects as well as um, microorganisms. Um, and I'm really interested to see um, what the fire season out west is going to be like this year too, because oh, yeah. all of that has kind of been getting a little wonky. And uh, so, with all of this water that's getting spread out, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think about like all all of the different ways that um, you're just getting a lot of things mixed together. You know, things are burning. You're getting a lot of nutrient deposits. You're getting water coming in, mixing with everything just seems ripe for new, not new, but um, less anticipated um, microorganism pests particularly. It just seems like there's kind of a recipe there for for some things to start thriving, um, having longer seasons um, than they used to have. Um, But I don't know. We'll see. Um, When the the cheeks... Oh, sorry. No, go for it. I'm going to say, when the Chicxulu meteor or asteroid, you know, uh, wiped out the dinosaurs about 66 million years ago, there was the great dying that happened afterwards. Right, right. And one thing that I delved into in my presentation for powdery mildew was that um, there was a lot of fungal growth, unprecedented fungal growth mm-hmm. that of those that go after dead and decaying organisms yeah. and, and things like that. So. There was a massive change, and uh, a- allegedly, according to some people, this ha- perhaps had an effect on lineages that you know eventually became what we now mm-hmm. know as powdery mildew and things like that. And so, I think that we will see cool, um, cool. We will see interesting. <laughs> Depends um, on who you are, maybe, in what context. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, it changes in this way, and certainly there will be different pressures for us. It might sound like, like you know, blasphemy. But one of the things I'm excited about, again, is this really interesting hybrid fusion of like tech and um, like, for example, you know, microbiology where, you know, we could perhaps use drones to apply uh, certain microbes or consortia of micro, right. uh, mm-hmm. you know, microorganisms onto the foliage, into the roots where, you know, like the average age of a, farmer in the united states is like in their 60s in their mid 60s i think last time i checked you know probably they don't need to be breaking their backs in the field is a thought that i have often and some people you know i mean like i think there's ways that we can make use of even the natural things in a way that is maybe not traditionally applied i don't think it loses value in this way um you Mm -hmm. know not to get on a, a a tirade or anything like that but i just feel like it's a little bit like, uh, like there's a way that we can appreciate it. Like, how, like fruit pick. I saw a lot of uh, people get excited about fruit picking robots and yeah, yeah, um, 
drones that apply pesticides, well, you could you don't have to apply like a noxious chemical. You could apply a right non- exactly a be... derived chemical. Yep, absolutely. And there's an example I've seen that really freaks people out, but I find it really fascinating. I just, you know, it's just one of those things. I don't know, but um, you know, basically these drone, um, they're basically little ants. Um, they also have little bees as well that fly, but, um, oh, know, yeah, robot, yeah. you know, little robot ants basically, um, that can crawl out theoretically into a field. And just like you're saying, you know, they can be sort of charged with a chemical or something and they can go to every single plant and either go down into the dirt, bite onto a root. And then that chemical, you know, sort of comes through it, um, in you yeah. know, sort of like a little uh, needle, you know, like injecting this chemical directly into the roots or into the plant tissues, like the leaf tissues. And, the, you know, again, I'm sure some people that hear that and are very freaked out. I don't want robot bugs all over my plants. I totally get it. But you've got to admit, <laughs> it's fascinating to think about the idea of being yeah. able to, in a very, you know, direct targeted way, um, deliver different controls, applications, and things. Um, and like you said, it doesn't all have to be like, you know, um, gnarly. Short sighted. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be, we're not, we don't have to send DDT into these things. We can, yeah, that's um, exactly. You know, there's, there's creative ways that we can think about using, because it's, it's these drones, they're just vessels you know, that can be used to do all sorts of things. And, you know, you attach things to them, give them, you know, abilities to do things. But, um, yeah, I think there's all sorts of creative ways in the, the robot ants, um, and the robot bees, because the robot bees have been developed for pollination to try to help with, um, pollination efforts. Um, but the ants are very interesting too. And I just think about how some, um, fungi work, like some of the cordyceps fungi and everything that will, take over an ant, direct the ant to go to the top of a plant and bite and sort of hang on. And then the mushroom grows and distributes, but you can sort of use that. You can be inspired by that ecological process, that biological process Mm -hmm. and kind of use the same sort of uh, behavior um, to, to do other things, other interesting things. So um, it's the same physics. It's the same thing, you know, and, and I want to add on to that because that's a really excellent point. I've even seen, uh, I think I saw, oh, I probably should say if I don't know, I feel like it was a DARPA, believe it or not, like a DARPA a research plan or something with regard, but it might have been someone else looking at using real aphids, actual aphids to administer. This is a thought that I had a long time ago as soon as I learned about, you know, their interactions and how they transmit viruses. Well, what if you'd use that for a positive thing? What if they mm-hmm. use them for inoculating with microbes that you actually want and not the ones that you don't want? And yeah, obviously that would have, that has its own sort of, um, you know, restrictions and, and you'd have to be very careful about how you're doing that sort of a thing, that implementation. But like, you know, if somebody has a negative response to that, I mean, sure, maybe, I mean, there could be problems with that. I don't know if, like where that research has gone or if it's even feasible, but like, it's kind of like, uh, you know, when I explain to people, you know, where insulin comes from now versus where it came from 50 years ago, mm-hmm. I think, you know, the answer to that, right, Jason, what do we used to do for insulin? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I remember. Sorry. We killed a lot of rabbits. That's okay. Oh, okay. But a lot of people would say that it might be better if we made it in, if we do what we do now, which is, um, derive it from yeast. You don't have to kill a ton of rabbits, every, you know, to save somebody from right. insulin. And I just feel like it's with that kind of sentiment and energy that I kind of come at some of these uh, changes mm-hmm. in technology, I think, where it's like, you know, would you rather us really be killing 100,000 rabbits so that people who have right. insulin issues don't die? Or are you consigning people to death or or whatever, or being injured in some way or affected because you know, biotechnology is icky and it makes you feel bad. You know, it feels bad. Right. It, uh, right. Diabetes. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like that's an yeah. incredibly, uh, yeah. um, uh, privileged perspective. Right. Yes, I agree. I agree. I do think it's a very, very privileged perspective. And I think a lot of people that, um, 
fall into those kind of mental traps um, often don't don't realize that that the whole reason they're able to think about biotechnology in that way is generally because they have so many options and lifestyle choices and things available to them that it seems like like well, we don't need this or there's a alternative ways you know whatever um and so then it seems uh like it's possible to quote unquote sort of be all natural or whatever that means because mm -hmm. i always point out to people i'm like well at what point you know humans are are our nature and i think about the complex activity of going back to ants you know you look at like leaf cutter ants and how complex they are and the way that they farm different bacteria and fungi and stuff and um you know i'm like humans we have a lot of crazy things we do especially when we're in groups um but at what point does that become unnatural like the products that we make the things that you know that we produce um yes and and why are those distinctions made um it gets really murky um and so i i try to always challenge folks that are really dogmatic in their um approach with that um to try to help draw the line like where where is the line um and you know i i view some of the complex biotechnology stuff that humans work on as no different than um figuring out what we would deem as simpler problems when, you know, a long time ago of trying to manipulate our environment in all sorts of other ways to survive oh, and yeah. improve quality of life and everything. And even on bringing this back to cannabis, you know, this is one reason why companies are looking at um, biosynthesizing cannabinoids um, to try to get the quantity of isolated cannabinoids like THC and CBD that the market seems to want without having to to get them from plants and there's a lot of debate over you know the sort of ethics of that it's like well if you can just grow the plant why don't you do all of that and it's like well yes but also there can be substantial energy savings and things related to biosynthesizing if the end goal is to get isolated cannabinoids anyway and they're needed in a certain you know quantity for certain purposes um it can be potentially better for the environment to not grow plants and do it a different way depending on the dynamics at play um and where you know a lot of this stuff happens with like e coli or um different strains of of different fungi and you with e coli at least you generally are feeding ethanol so there's different different things where's the sugar and ethanol and stuff how's it being handled it's all sorts of like environmental controls quality things to uh, keep in mind when you're getting into biosynthesizing compounds but there are strong arguments to be made of why you know um at some point when you've got seven eight nine billion people in the world and you've got demand for a certain medicine vitamin whatever it may be yeah, at what point you know, are we going to are we going to grow, you know, fields of these plants over and over and over again and apply all the things it takes to get those plants grown to make those chemicals or do we teach E coli how to take sugar and 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 <laughs> you know, digest it, Figure and, it out <laughs> and make whatever compounds we need and harvest them out that way? You know, these are important conversations for people to, to think about and to not just sort of um, have that knee-jerk reaction of like, oh, that's that's off-putting or that's not natural. It's like, well, the conversation has to get a lot more nuanced than that in order, I think, to, to decide whether something is, is ethical or not. There's a lot to balance. And like you're saying, there's the quality of life of those affected um and there are real um, environmental impacts to consider. Um, I think that's one reason why, like, um, you know, I've always wondered, like, how possible would it be if everyone were to all of a sudden be vegan? What would that look like from an environmental perspective in terms of mm -hmm. different resource and land requirements and things like that? 
um, there's a lot of good, and a lot of this comes too from my graduate studies because studying environmental science, we had to do debates on a lot of this stuff. And when you start diving into a lot of the information and stats and everything, you realize like these are really hard problems like that there aren't clear answers to. And so I guess all of that rambling is to say, um, give technology a chance. It can be good. <laughs> it's just all in the pr proper context and, uh, and everything. The problem is that it's a dilemma. Yeah. The problem is that's not a problem because a problem has a solution. <laughs> yeah. We have a dilemma. At the very least you yeah. have a dilemma where we have two options and neither of them are really a perfect solution. Right. You know, right. and we talked about a lot of virtual things today and one of the other things would be virtual resources. Yeah. Australia mm -hmm. exports a lot of its materials, a lot of farming. Yeah. But a lot of that stuff is water and that gets exported with the stuff. They bring in the water yeah. and then they use it and then they transport it out. And so they don't actually have the water. Not right. really. It's just passing through. Um, yeah. That's it's interesting. It's just passing yeah. through. It's, yeah. So, I mean, there's other kinds of virtual aspects to consider. And, and even from the biotech for space, you know, uh, I think I talked about this on another podcast, but long and short of it is like, um, through horizontal gene transfer and things, so there are MRSA, you know, MRSA, like the, the mm -hmm. bacteria that get that are medically resistant. They, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, right? And right. those genes of resistance, those get into the environment. They have already done that. And they have gone into tons of bacteria in the marine environment. And guess what? When you ingest some of them, when you're out swimming in the ocean, because the report that I was I'm referencing here, I think the title is literally, is it safe to go back in the ocean? So just yeah. look that up on Google. Or maybe ask Chat GP with it, GPT what it thinks of it. Because yeah. when, you get, when, you, when you get these bacteria in your gut that have these antibiotic resistance genes and then maybe even trade them with other stuff in your mm -hmm. body, that could be a real problem. Um, uh, or, and the same thing, and I guess from an agricultural perspective, the same is true of the bios that we use. You know, you still have to be responsible. You can't just spray it wantonly and think there's <laughs> going to be no effect either. Yeah. Um, yeah. So even, even your natural, primitive, or whatever you want to say, and I don't mean that in a, in a denigrating way, um, tons of things we do are primitive, and that's totally yep. fine. But I'm, I'm just trying to say that now that we know what the potential effects are, we got to be responsible for it. That's yeah, all there yeah, is really to yeah. it. Maybe not very American of me, but hey, you know, <laughs> I know that that's. No, the American response is load up your atomizer with as much as you can. You spray as much as you can. <laughs> cover every plant as much as you can. And Don't uh, worry about it. I want to do what I want. I'm exactly. not going to worry about the consequences. All that matters yeah. is that at the end of the day, all your plants are looking good and you find the right lab that'll give you your 45% THC result. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> the system keeps going. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think we've almost hit the two hour mark. So this is probably a good spot to uh, cut it off, but this has been a fun conversation. Um, <laughs> when in all sorts of rambles and, and directions um, that I hope were entertaining for folks that are listening. If any of you have listened all the way through um congratulations you've made it to we're at an hour and 53 almost um so um good job on any of you out there for sticking with us with that everybody um go check out matthew's presentations and things that have come out um recently look at um you said those were in the future canvas project o2 channel because now there's there's two That's of them right. um apparently yeah, I noticed that recently. I think it's just called like FCPO2 um, on YouTube. Yeah. But um, go check out Matthew's presentations on there. I think it's like an hour and a half long, wasn't it? The one you did recently? Uh, or that was yeah, your live stream, like maybe. That. But, um, oh, maybe. But yeah, they're about that size. There's usually like a 30 minute or so presentation, and we mm -hmm. usually do questions and answers. So, yeah, just those two yeah. in particular, I recommend folks look up the Future Cannabis Project and then the. Um, live stream you did recently on your your personal side um, um, those those because I'm gonna try to get this episode out pretty recently so that should be relevant when people hear this I always worry that I give people references of things to go look at and then like the episode doesn't come out for two months and 
<laughs> everything's buried by the time, but they should be able to find it this time. So um, keep track of that. Matthew will also be joining us for our Curious About Cannabis Masterclass this year um, sometime in um, like um, April or so. Um, yes. So if you're interested in joining us for the Curious About Cannabis Masterclass, you'll get a chance to um, learn from Matthew there and have a chance to talk to him as well. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, you can go to masterclasscannabis.com. Some folks have trouble with the links. I don't know why. Um, but if you have trouble with the links, just go to cacpodcast.com and look at our events page and it's listed there as well. This is actually the first, I'm just realizing this is the first special guest, uh, that I've announced for the masterclass. I haven't mentioned who all's, um, going to be, um, presenting and everything. So there's our first one. Um, so yeah, Matthew, thanks so much for being willing to come on and ramble with me for two hours about technology and AI and um, a little bit of cannabis science thrown in there too. I've really appreciated it. It's been fun. Absolutely. I'm I'm very happy that I was able to talk about all these different topics and we got to really air it out, really expose a lot of these interesting topics that are going to be relevant to us. Maybe some of that yeah. stuff wasn't specific to cannabis by itself, but it certainly will become an influencing factor in all of our lives in various yeah. contexts. So I think it's still relevant to talk about, Absolutely. obviously. And and I'm and I think we got some really cool references in there. Um, it's rare that I get to feel like it's okay to make an anime or reference or four. So <laughs> yes, I have no problem yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah, no worries here. I can always I I haven't always seen. There's a lot of anime I haven't seen, but there is a lot. Me too. The, a lot of the big ones, yeah, because there's so much. Um, but a lot of the big <laughs> ones I've seen, and uh, to really um, date myself a little bit, um, I realized the other day on YouTube there was, uh, you remember the old Dragon Ball Z movies back before, like Frieza and all of that? There were um, some older oh, sure. movies. And I actually found those on YouTube recently and really geeked out and like threw those on the TV for like, three <laughs> hours. Uh, Tree of Might and uh, all of those stuff that I remember when Toonami came on on um, Adult Swim back in um, what was that ninety eight nineteen ninety eight I think it was was when Toonami it's gotta be um, came out um, but man I remember those Dragon Ball Z movies coming on there um, and all that made me want to go back and and rewatch a whole lot of stuff but anyway. Um, that all being said, um, everyone, now you've got a little more insight into the things I think about when I'm not thinking about science and cannabis stuff. Um, but I appreciate all of you for tuning in and, um, I will catch you next time. So stay curious, everybody. Take it easy. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon so you get notified of more videos and go ahead and check out another video while you're at it. 